everyone. And are we live? Takes a few seconds. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth talk in quarantine talks. Today we have the pleasure of our president, Luke Booth, joining us for a talk on accretion disks, large and small. He's going to talk about black holes and planet formation. Luke is going into his fourth year at the University of Birmingham. And with no further ado, Luke, it's over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Amrasha. Um, so hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to the fifth talk in AstroSoc's quarantine talk series. Uh, as Amrasha said, my name is Luke, and I'm the current president of AstroSoc for the 2020-2021 year. Um, before I begin, I'd like to kind of say a really big thank you to everyone who's joining us live and for all of those who come and watch the talks uh, after they air and once they're on, on YouTube. Um, honestly, the, the work that has gone into setting up this talk series uh, and, and everything that goes with that, um, it, it, there is quite a lot of work and hard work that goes into doing that. Uh, but the, the engagement from all of you uh, really does make the, that hard work uh, and effort worthwhile. So yeah, thank you to, to everyone. Um, anyway, without further ado, uh, let's get started. So as a species uh, and, a, and a civilization, uh, we've been looking up at the stars for millennia, um, using them to do things like tell stories of gods, uh, navigate and, and many other things besides that. However, some amongst us have sought a, a deeper meaning. Um, and to this day, we, we still do. Um, trying to understand the night sky, the universe, the, the solar system, everything uh, around us. Uh, and we've done this by sort of pairing observations with both mathematics, uh, philosophy as well. Um, and using this, uh, the early astronomers, Greek astronomers uh, in particular, constructed uh, a model of the universe that was centered on the earth. After all, we see the, star, the, the stars uh, travel across the night sky, the sun rises and, and sets. So why should we not be in the center of the universe uh, with the stars fixed in the background? Well, we now understand uh, through observations from people like Galileo and Copernicus that obviously that is not the case. Um, and this was initially done through observations made with relatively small telescopes uh, using just, just the visible part of the spectrum, so just our eyes. Now, as you can see here, uh, the visible part of the spectrum is a tiny, tiny region of the entire electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it runs from roughly uh, 380 to ish nanometers to about uh, 750 nanometers, and it spans uh, a range of between 10 to, 10 to the power of 14 and 10 to the power of 15 hertz. It really is quite a narrow window. However, as, as you can see on the graph, uh, there. The electromagnetic spectrum itself spans close to 10 to the 24 uh, orders of magnitude. Um, uh, sorry, 24 orders of magnitude from 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 24 hertz. Uh, and, and it is a really, really large range. And this is the kind of range that we now use to study the universe at large. We observe in virtually every single um, frequency range. And in fact, some others that aren't shown on here. So recently, I'm sure many of you will have heard of uh, gravitational waves. Uh, we've been using those to also study the, uh, the universe in a non-electromagnetic way. Uh, and this has shed quite a lot of light on um, plenty of things, uh, in particular black holes, which is obviously a part of this talk. Um, and yeah, it, it's proving to, to be an absolutely vital contribution to some of the new physics uh, that, we're, that we're learning about. Um, at the moment, this is done using uh, two different collaborations, two different experiments. Uh, LIGO, which is based both in Hanford and Livingston in the USA, and Virgo, which is based in Italy. Uh, however, in the next decade or so, I believe that's roughly the time scale at least, uh, we are looking to expand this. So as you can see on the graph, you have uh, space interferometers from 10 to the minus 4 hertz to 10 to the 0 hertz. Now this will be the, uh, the LISA mission, which is gonna be a series of three spacecraft um, flying in formation. Uh, it will create far longer baselines and will allow us to examine uh, different areas of the universe, different uh, frequencies that these events occur at. 
Uh, and so, as you can see, one of those things is uh, to look at compact stars, uh, which is another topic we'll, we'll come on to a little bit later, uh, that are captured by these supermassive black holes, which occur in the centre of galaxies. So I've given you uh, a very brief introduction to kind of how we observe and the range in, over which we observe. Uh, this is now uh, really quite large. Um, and so we can now dive into uh, the main part of the talk, the part of the talk that hopefully you're all here for, which is the bit about accretion disks. Um, so yeah, what is an accretion disk? Well, simply put, it's a disk shaped structure comprising of material, um, mostly gas, dust, maybe some rocky uh, material as well, um, orbiting a central massive body. So what do I mean by a central massive body? Could it be anything with mass? Well, not quite. That's a slightly different definition, uh, normally used by particle physicists. What I mean when I say a central massive body is something really quite heavy, something like a star, um, a, a, maybe a stellar remnant, so something a little bit heavier perhaps, that is very dense, something like a neutron star, uh, or even, even larger than that, black holes and supermassive black holes, the heaviest objects known in our universe. Um, and the other question that I would imagine you would probably first ask is, why a disk? Why is it not an accretion sphere or an, accre an accretion cube? Cube perhaps is a bit of a long stretch, but a sphere would be, would be quite reasonable. Um, so why do, we, why do we assume that? Well, it turns out the answer to that isn't entirely simple. Um, and there are elements where actually we do use some spherical components. However, um, depending on the type of accretion disk, um, we actually have, um, it, it forms this disk shape uh, from potentially a, a sphere or a non-flat disk uh, initially. And that is down to angular momentum, uh, some forces, some friction, um, and a few other components. So if you were to consider this spherical case, uh, imagine a perfect sphere, um, of, of different small particles, so gas molecules, uh, du tiny dust grains, things like that, orbiting around this central body. Uh, as the particles orbit, they collide and interact with each other. And in doing so, they're able to exchange both kinetic energy uh, and angular momentum. And they also lose energy, a little bit of energy while doing this. Um, the exchange uh, effectively slowly uh, brings all the orbits down into roughly uh, the same plane. Uh, and which is therefore forming a disk structure. Uh, and in this structure, uh, collisions are less likely, though, uh, though they do happen and they happen quite a lot. Um, but if you were to imagine something orbiting, I'm gonna try and use my hands here, um, kind of around this way, and then you've got something orbiting that way, those things are far more likely to collide with each other at a point, rather than if everything is orbiting uh, in the same plane all at the same, roughly the same rotation speed. Uh, jumped a couple of sides there. <laughs> um, so material actually accreting onto uh, a supermassive black hole or a, even just a, a regular black hole uh, can often come from multiple sources. Uh, so multiple stars, for instance. Uh, and this material it can be pressure stripped. We've heard a little bit about that in uh, some of our first talks uh, from nearby stars, uh, effectively as they pass through the, the accretion disk, um, the drag uh, in effect can strip off some of the gas from the star, uh, but mostly the, the material is stripped due to the intense gravitational forces that, uh, that a black hole uh, has. And, and those forces acting on the star uh, strip out some of the outer layers uh, when the when the orbit uh, becomes really, really close. Uh, this material uh, settles into the disk-shaped structure, uh, as I spoke about, um, through, through collisions with, with itself, with uh, other material. Um, and slowly, uh, this material then spirals inwards uh, until the black hole consumes it, uh, effectively eats the material, uh, and that becomes uh, part of the black hole itself. Um, this, uh, this inward spiral effect is, is caused by friction uh, more than gravity. Obviously, gravity is, is a very, still a very strong factor, uh, but the actual inward spiral is, yeah, caused by friction. Um, the orbit around the, par 
the orbit of the particles uh, around the black hole is not smooth. So if you were to think of, uh, for instance, the Earth uh, going orbiting the sun, that's a fairly smooth orbit. There's nothing really in the way, uh, you know, a few micrometeorites here and there, but nothing of any, of any similar size, for instance. Well, the, the orbit of the particles around the black hole is not like that. There are plenty of other particles. They're all roughly the same size. Um, and they're all basically jostling for position. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of turbulence there. And this actually causes the particles to heat up. Um, in doing so, they radiate away some energy uh, and lose some kinetic energy and a little bit of angular momentum as well, uh, which causes them to drift inwards. Um, this occurs because actually when they lose energy, this kinetic energy, uh, assuming that their mass remains constant, which is a, a fairly reasonable assumption to make, um, the loss of energy is effectively uh, shown, uh, mediates itself as a, a reduction in the velocity of the particle. Um, and due to this reduction in velocity, the orbit that it traces, uh, the radius of that orbit must decrease. Hence, it spirals inwards. But in doing so, in, in spiraling inwards and in coming closer, the particle falls further down the gravitational potential well of the central massive body, in this case, of the black hole. And actually, this causes the particle to speed back up. So the particles actually start to move faster and faster. But crucially, they've lost angular momentum, which is how they can spiral inwards. Um, I kind of, I guess, to try and uh, illustrate that point, I don't know how many of you may have heard of a spiral wishing well. Uh, it's something where you could put a coin in the top and the coin would slowly um, run round the outside until it dropped further and further and further in. And as it, as it got closer and closer to the central hole, uh, in effect, the black hole, the, the speed of that coin would, would increase. That is very much uh, an Earth-like analogy for, for what is going on here. Uh, as the process repeats, the, the velocity gets higher and higher and higher. And eventually, there is the frictional heating, uh, so the heating caused by the particles rubbing against each other, is so, so strong that it actually generates temperatures of roughly 10 million degrees Kelvin, um, or 10 million degrees Celsius. At this point, the two are analogous to one another. Uh, and this causes the release of X-ray photons uh, very close to the event horizon. Uh, beyond the event horizon, nothing is really seen um, as no light can escape. So to kind of illustrate that, uh, I've got a bit of an infographic here um, that should show you when it appears, um, the very center of the galaxy. So on the right, um, you should be able to see a very, very bright, very luminous region in the center. Uh, and that is due to this, this emission of X-ray particles, uh, as you can see. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, the accretion disk basically shines very brightly. Um, in, there were other types of accretion disks, however. Um, and you can have accretion disks uh, that occur in binary star systems. Now, binary star systems are when you have two or sometimes more stars orbiting one another. Uh, they may still have planets, but mostly it's about the two stars orbiting one another. Now, you might think, well, how common are these systems? You know, are there many of them out there? It turns out that they, these star systems are more common than our own. So there are more binary, tertiary, and uh, upward star systems than there are single star systems in the universe. Um, so these, these behave in a, a slightly different manner to, to those uh, of black holes. Um, often, uh, to, to have these, one of the stars has to have evolved uh, faster than, than the other, uh, meaning that it's, it's burnt through all of its hydrogen, all of its gas, all of its fuel, um, gone to the end of its life and formed a, a dense uh, stellar uh, re remnant, uh, something like a black hole, uh, a white dwarf or a neutron star. Now, when the second star uh, goes through its evolution, when it reaches its giant phase, it starts to swell up. Um, it gets larger and larger. And as such, the, uh, the gravitational attraction of the outer layers is not quite so strong. Um, as, as it once was. And this means that in effect, um, if the, the stars are in a close binary, 
uh, what can actually happen is the smaller companion can exert a stronger gravitational force uh, on the on the gas and dust uh, once it crosses uh, a region known as the Rocher lobe or the Rocher zone. Uh, and at this point, the material is then attracted to this stellar companion. Now, it doesn't get attracted uh, directly. There's no sort of straight line attraction. Uh, and that's due to the, the rotation of the two objects, how they are orbiting around each other um, and the, the intrinsic spin that these stars have, their, their rotation um, on, around their own axis. And so uh, a disk slowly forms where the material is spiraling around this stellar remnant and eventually will be accreted onto it. Now in these systems, um, the, the gravitational forces are not as strong uh, as they are in black holes. And so the material uh, is not heated to, to the same degree. Although the rest of the, the other processes are the same, uh, the, the friction generating an inward spiral, um, you don't get the same heating, which means that you don't get the emission of those X-ray photons uh, from the accretion disk. However, it doesn't mean to say that, um, that these, these objects can't still be bright. In fact, actually, some of these are very, very bright. For instance, accretion onto a, a white dwarf uh, ends up producing a type 1a supernova. Uh, and accretion onto um, neutron stars can potentially lead to, to relativistic jets, um, which kind of can act as a lighthouse type effect. Uh, they're emitted from either side. Um, or it can uh, spin up and actually revive um, neutron stars, uh, known as pulsars, that are spinning very rapidly. So we'll, the first one we'll discuss uh, is, is white dwarfs. Um, so when, when you get accretion onto a white dwarf, um, there, there is no sort of instantaneous reaction, really. Um, what, what happens is the material slowly builds the mass of the star. And once this crosses a, a boundary, a threshold known as the Chandrasekhar limit, of about 1.44 solar masses. So that is 1.44 times the, the mass of our own sun. Um, the white dwarf starts to become uh, unstable uh, and it starts to basically um, sort of collapse really. In, in collapsing, uh, it, it contracts and this contraction actually uh, warms the star. It heats the star and provides enough thermal energy uh, to be able to fuse the, the carbon and the oxygen in, in the star uh, almost immediately into, into iron and into nickel, uh, both reactions which are not actually energetically favourable. When the reaction goes from subsonic to supersonic, so the rate of that reaction uh, basically increases, uh, you, you get a supernova. Uh, and these are incredibly, incredibly bright objects, uh, very, very energetic, and in fact produce enough luminosity uh, that they are bright enough that they outshine the entire galaxy uh, that they are they are hosted in. Uh, using this, we can actually uh, help measure distances in the universe. It's one of the, the key parameters that is helping to determine something known as the Hubble parameter, the Hubble constant. Um, and we've been able to do a lot of other cool physics with them as well. Uh, the other type of, of accretion uh, we we could have uh, for a binary star system is onto a pulsar. So a pulsar is a type of rotating uh, neutron star. It has uh, incredibly, incredibly strong magnetic fields. Uh, and effectively it has jets that come out of either side of it, out of its magnetic poles as shown in, in the diagram. Uh, and these um, can, can sort of sweep round. So if they pass by Earth, we get a sudden uh, influx uh, often in the radio band of, of energy, uh, of information, and we can tell that, this, that we have a pulsar. This was in fact how they were, how pulsars and uh, by, by extension neutron stars were, were first discovered uh, by a PhD student in Cambridge, uh, Jocelyn Bell, I believe it was. Um, now, in doing so, in, in emitting these radiation beams, um, it actually carries away some angular momentum which means the, the star, the pulsar, slowly slows down uh, until, it, until it dies, basically. Uh, it, it's no longer rotating. But accretion onto 
uh, such a star carries its own angular momentum. So the gas that is, uh, that is orbiting it, when it actually attaches, effectively it attaches on and keeps spinning. So it transfers that angular, angular momentum, which means that it can either revive a dead uh, pulsar, so it can actually effectively switch it back on again, uh, or it can spin up existing pulsars, uh, basically making them rotate faster. Uh, and these objects are then uh, known as millisecond pulsars. They, they spin very, very, very rapidly. Um, but neither of these two topics were actually the things that I was going to talk to you about uh, originally. Where, when, I was first, uh, when I first agreed to give uh, a talk uh, with a title beginning with A as part of the, the, the series, I came up with um, the title uh, Accretion Discs, um, actually based on what I'm interested in, which is exoplanet research. And I was hoping I could talk to you about protoplanetary disks uh, and planet formation. Now, as it turns out, it's a, it's a bit of a, a weird, sli slightly gray area um, where protoplanetary disks seem to come under the banner of accretion disks, but there is no real accretion actually involved. Uh, so yeah, go figure that one out. Um, however, um, well, there, there, there is some, but you know, um, stars are originally born inside uh, nebulae or dense molecular clouds. Um, and, and they are born actually through an accretion type process where you do have uh, slight over densities of material um, attracting one another gravitationally. Uh, these eventually clump together and attract more and more and more material until the, the, the core of the star uh, starts to heat up. Uh, that attraction, the, the exchange of energy, uh, starts heating the core to, to thousands, millions of degrees, uh, billions of degrees even, I think it is. Um, and at that point, the, st the fusion processes can start to ignite. Uh, you start to get uh, the, the start of stellar fusion. Now, you've still got some leftover material in this, uh, in this cloud, this, this uh, molecular cloud. And this material slowly um, starts to form into a disc-shaped structure around this, this proto-star, this brand new star. Um, and from this uh, material, uh, we, we get the birth of planets. So I've, I've got up here um, a, an array of a variety of different protoplanetary disks. They all look uh, pretty different. Um, and the, perhaps the, the most special one is HL Tauri. Um, this is one of the first disks where we were pretty certain that we were observing the formation of a brand new planet. Now planets form actually in, in a very similar way to, to stars in some respects, uh, where you have a slight over density slight uh, perturbation in the density of, of material in the disk, which attracts uh, more material to it. This material coalesces, it clumps together, um, and slowly and slowly it accumulates more and more material until it starts to, to effectively clear its orbit as it's going round. Um, that is the definition of a planet. But once this happens, um, you once the, 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 the planetary body effectively uh, is, gets much larger than roughly about a kilometre. Uh, the, the gravitational force it, it is feeling uh, from the star in the centre should actually attract it inwards and effectively obliterate the star. So, so our, our small rocky planets uh, really ought to get obliterated um, quite early on. And this was, was something that was puzzling uh, astronomers and physicists for, for decades. Uh, we, we didn't seem to have a good way of explaining it. We obviously knew that that wasn't what always happened because, hey, here we are on a rocky planet. Um, but there was no proper explanation for this. But actually, when we first received these images, uh, roughly back in sort of 2011, 2012 time, uh, we were able to, to discern that actually the, the disk was denser uh, towards the center. And actually this density of the disk prevented uh, the planets from, from migrating inwards and actually acted as a buffer effectively. Um, so, and this is, this is what has saved our, our rocky planets. Um, I, I personally think that this field is, is incredibly interesting, being able to, to learn about the, the formation of brand new planets almost as they're happening in, in a sense. To me, I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, and to be able to see both um, how this occurs and for it to be able to answer some of our models uh, is incredibly useful. 
Um, however, doing this is, is still quite a, a challenging process. Um, so the, because there is so much gas, dust and debris uh, around, around this, this newly formed star, um, the light from the star uh, really can't penetrate it. Dust grains are, are opaque. Um, gas molecules can absorb uh, light uh, and don't always re-radiate at, at the same frequency, at the same wavelength. Um, so we had to come up with kind of a, a different way of, of viewing them. Now, when the, when the gas and dust actually absorbs uh, radiation, absorbs energy, um, it, it heats them up very slightly. And um, this, this temperature correspondence actually corresponds to the infrared region. Now, it means that the, the, the dust grains effectively re-radiate light uh, at much lower wavelengths. Um, and much, much lower energies. Um, and this, this, is, uh, th this travels pretty much unimpeded uh, to Earth. I say pretty much unimpeded because once it reaches Earth, it has to pass through our atmosphere. Now, our atmosphere is actually um, is very opaque to infrared, um, which, is, which is quite unfortunate for astronomy. Uh, although, obviously, having an atmosphere is, is vital for life, so we do kind of need it. Um, but it means that we have to find ways around um, ways around this if, if this is what we want to observe. Um, we can do that in one or two ways, uh, an expensive way or an even more expensive way. Um, the first of those is, is obviously the, the kind of typical answer. If you want to avoid the atmosphere, what do you do? You send something into space. Uh, but it is very, very difficult and very expensive to put large telescopes uh, and telescope arrays up in space. And we need something pretty large to actually um, distinguish this kind of structure. So instead, what we can do is look for uh, suitable locations, um, places in which we can uh, build obser observatories. Uh, ideally, these places want to be very high up. So we minimize the amount of atmosphere between us and the, the target uh, star or system that we are looking at. And we also want those to be quite dry. So back in, uh, in fact, in the, in the mid 1990s, um, both America, Japan, and uh, some, some European countries were looking at, at doing this. And they decided to, to join forces in effect and build um, the, the ALMA, um, the Atacama, Atacama Large Millimeter Array uh, over in Chile, uh, in, in the Chilean Atacama Desert. Now, why build it in a desert? Well. There's a couple of reasons. Uh, less water vapor, uh, uh, which uh, basically blocks radio and millimeter wavelengths. So that's good. It means that we've got more signal coming through. And also uh, desert land is not particularly useful either. So bonus is there. Uh, so yeah, we have um, the, the Alma array, uh, some absolutely beautiful skies above it, uh, seemingly constant much better than, than those we get in Birmingham. It's at very, very high altitude, so 5,000 meters, about 16 and a half thousand feet. Um, and the baselines, the, the separation between these telescopes uh, can actually reach up to 16 kilometers, uh, which basically creates a, a really, really large array and allows us to take the, the detailed uh, photographs that, that we can and see these relatively small, uh, astronomical, astronomically speaking, structures. Um, I think that's pretty much all I've got to say. Uh, obviously, I'm welcoming questions uh, after this. So I hope you have enjoyed the talk. Uh, and I look forward to, to trying to answer some of your questions uh, a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. That was an excellent talk. It was absolutely splendid. And I learned a lot about accretion disks. And I'm pretty sure our viewers really enjoyed learning more about accretion disks as well. I think we might give it a couple of minutes before beginning the Q&A, so about maybe three minutes-ish, and then we can start off and with the Q&A in case anyone wants to get a drink or a breather or anything. That sounds good, thank you. Okay, so will we stay here? I think we'll wait until 3.34, it's 31 now, and okay. then yeah. That's fine. Three minutes.
I guess we'll just start off with like a really light discussion before beginning the q and I guess. <laughs> that is absolutely fine. Please, please, please do. I'll, I'll see what I can do. How did you choose like the topic of proto of accretion disks disks in general? I guess I mean it's really interesting. Um, so exoplanet um, studies uh, and and studies of planets in general has been something that's interested me for for quite some time now. Um, it might sound a little bit cheesy, but I was kind of really really interested in it after watching uh, a lot of sci-fi stuff, uh, Star Wars in particular, and the idea of having uh, life on other planets was was just mesmerizing um that really really got me interested uh and kind of looking up at the night sky was something that i did a lot as a kid um and so yeah i, I thought you know i'll go do a physics degree i'll, I'll do astrophysics um and, and exoplanet studies was, was something that I, I went into mm -hmm. i'm very fortunate in the fact that actually uh this kind of time is a really great time to be an exoplanet scientist um mm -hmm. we're, we've we've been able to do a lot with uh, with planet det uh, detection and we're now pretty much at a stage where certainly for some planets uh, and hopefully for a few more once James Webb launches uh, we should be able to start looking into their atmospheres uh, seeing what what molecules are in their atmospheres and actually that can give us a, a fairly good idea as to either if there could be life there or if, if the planet could possibly even support life so combining those things together um, I think is is absolutely fascinating um, yeah, I kind of went for uh, accretion disks as uh, it, it needed to fill the, the memnotic. Uh, I was going to go for, um, for for something exoplanet based anyway, uh, and this was something that I've uh, I haven't talked much about before, but I have touched on very briefly in a, in another Astro sort of thing. In fact, I think it was part of um, a strong, an astronomy in the city event hosted by the department. Uh, but I thought I'd revisit it in a little bit more detail. Um, we don't get seem to get taught much about it uh, overly, but it's something that is is absolutely fascinating and still uh, needs a lot of answers. Um, there, there were a couple of other things that I didn't quite mention in the talk that are still areas of very active research. Mm. Um, so it's it's an intriguing area. Excellent. That sounds very exciting, and it's wonderful to see such a scientifically driven source of motivation as well. <laughs> Um, so I guess I'll start off with the Q&A directly and at the moment looking at the YouTube live chat there don't seem to be any questions so I'll probably start off with a couple of questions of my own then. Go for it, that's fine. Uh, and while you were explaining the binary star accretion disks, you mentioned that the second star swells up. Yep. Why, why does the second star swell up? Is this because um, when you said second star, I'm assuming that means that it's the more massive star? So uh, not technically. Uh, so normally mo more massive stars uh, actually evolve faster. They, they effectively eat through their, their hydrogen, their, their fuel, uh, burn brighter and live shorter. So actually the, the more massive star is likely to be the one that has already formed this compact stellar object. Uh, so the, the, white, the white dwarf or the, the neutron star. Uh, but the, the second star, for instance, could be a star uh, very much like our own sun. Um, and as that evolves, uh, it, it, it's fusing hydrogen into, into helium. Uh, and this requires a certain temperature. Now, what happens is that after a certain point, we've uh, kind of exhausted most of the hydrogen in the core. So we can no longer fuse hydrogen into helium. And the temperatures aren't high enough to, to fuse uh, helium into the next stage up, which is often beryllium uh, or sometimes carbon. So what happens is um, to actually to heat up further, the star has to contract, but in doing so, there's kind of a bounce. So effectively the star uh, contracts first and then uh, is abruptly halted when uh, the temperatures are high enough to then restart fusion. This builds the, the pressure in the star, the hydrostatic pressure, which is what prevents the star from collapsing under its own gravitational force. Uh, and so the outer layers, when they're falling in, they kind of get bounced and, and then start to expand again. Um, and this is, this is what effectively uh, ejects the outer layers um, in, in the star. Now, there are a few more things that go on. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly well versed uh, on stellar evolution. I probably ought to be at this stage. Um, but yeah, that's that's the rough gist of it. Great, that that 
answers my question quite well, thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, while you were explaining the accretion disks and binary star systems, I couldn't help thinking about triple star systems. Do they have accretion disks? <laughs> Um, so I must admit, it's not something I've come across, uh, but there is no reason why you couldn't have uh, an accretion disk in a triple star system. Uh, triple star systems, from, from what I know at least, are they are rarer um, as to have uh, three orbits that are gravitationally uh, bound and basically don't uh, eject one another uh, is, is, a lot, is a lot harder to do. Um, and the chances are that in all reality, you would probably only have two of the stars in a close binary. So only two of them would be uh, quite tightly bound uh, and so be able to actually accrete matter off one another. And the third star uh, is normally orbiting uh, effectively around the two center stars. So although it is a, a tertiary star system, uh, the three don't kind of interlock as, as you would have for, for instance, stars orbiting uh, Sagittarius A star, uh, the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Perfect. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, in terms of audience, I, I think we might as well have some future, I mean, applicants watching for the University of Birmingham's physics department. In particular, I mean, this question is addressed particularly for them, I guess, in a way. But in terms of exoplanet research and discovery or your interests in the field, is there any advice that you would like to give to students who are interested in pursuing astronomy? Um, so, I mean, pursuing astronomy in general, um, it's not as narrow as you think. So I think sometimes uh, students might be put off uh, from, from going for a, an astronomy degree, an astrophysics degree, uh, or, or doing physics with astrophysics, thinking that, okay, while it might be really cool and it's really interesting, what am I going to do at the end of it? Am I going to become a professional astronomer, a researcher? What am I going to do? Well, in truth, you can still pretty much do anything. Um, you learn very similar skills. We, we do a lot of coding. In fact, most of astrophysics, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on if you like coding or not, is, uh, is code-based. You do a lot of simulation work. Uh, and so, so that is definitely something that goes for you. Um, but you also have to do a lot of analytical work. Uh, although there's the, the maths behind it is sometimes less, vigor, uh, less rigorous even, um, the, the coding that goes on uh, and the, the analytics that you have to do, uh, and also the, the three-dimensional thinking when you're dealing with large data sets, uh, that's something we, we do in astronomy fairly regularly, um, are, are all very much transferable skills that can go into uh, high paying careers, things like banking, uh, finance, uh, any sort of analytical sciences. Uh, so, so the skills there are very transferable. Uh, in terms of uh, why come and do exoplanets, uh, I mean, my, my basic answer would be, it's just really cool. Uh, you know, how would, how would you love to, to be out observing a star somewhere? You see uh, a dip in the, in the star's brightness, uh, perhaps, or, or you see the star wobble, in your, in your signal. And from that, through repeat follow-up measurements, you're able to say that you discovered a planet or you indirectly observed another planet around another star. I mean, I, I think that's incredible. You know, we look up at the night sky and you can see you can see so many stars. If you're lucky, sometimes you can see the planets of our, of our own solar system. And we know quite a lot about those planets, but we don't know an awful, awful lot about the other planets we've never visited them however kind of doing this studies the doing exoplanet science uh and, and stuff like that you can you can uh find out a, a huge amount about these stars uh for instance what are they made of are they are they likely to be a gas giant are they likely to be an ice giant uh, or are they a rocky star a rocky planet even sorry or maybe they're they're really odd they're they're too dense they're denser than anything we have in our solar system or anything that we should have could it be a strict planetary core? You know, are, are we just looking at the core of a planet? Uh, you know, how far away is it orbiting from its star? Well, okay, using that we can we can work out what temperature the planet is likely to be. Uh, does it have an atmosphere we can detect? Okay, now we can build in things like greenhouse effect if we can find the molecules. Um, and you can kind of build and build and build that picture until you can start to get an idea. What might that planet be like? 
Is it a rocky planet? Is it a gas giant? That's a fairly easy characterization. Uh, is it orbiting, you know, really far away or really close? Okay, is it hot or cold? Um, but there are there are more and more things we're able to to characterize and parameterize, uh, and with the the advancements in telescope technology, uh, the the huge range of missions that are either going on or will be will be launching in the next few years, um, it's a very very exciting time. There's a lot of new data coming in. Uh, you know, we've just had we've had the completion of Kepler, uh, that was decommissioned I believe last year, uh, but at the moment we've got tests running. Uh, I think there are a couple of other exoplanet uh, observation missions going on at the moment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, James Webb uh, is, is set to be able to do some absolutely fantastic work for us uh, and to yeah, hopefully be able to tell us what is in the atmosphere. Imagine finding that the atmosphere of another planet that you can observe has a composition almost exactly the same as ours. How amazing would that be? That was absolutely wonderful. And personally, I also agree with that. I mean, it is absolutely amazing. Like it blows my mind when I look up at the night sky and I realize that, hey, perhaps what they're teaching us in university in my computing module can actually be used to analyze the cosmic microwave background. And I can look back into the Big Bang itself. And it's, it's absolutely amazing, yeah. It is. Seeing as that there are no more questions in the YouTube live chat, I guess I'm going to just close with one final question for you. Go for and it. what are your future plans with, uh, with regards to astrophysics or your career path in general? Where do you see, like perhaps a better way to phrase the question would be, where do you see yourself in five or 10 years from now? <laughs> uh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, it's what I'm hoping to do is actually go on and do this as a career. Uh, I am absolutely fascinated by, by exoplanets, um, by, by looking at trying to discover them uh, is, is really cool. Trying to characterize them, I think, is even cooler. And what I've tried to do actually over my undergraduate degree is do a little bit of everything. So I've done a little bit of spectroscopy work. I looked at some, some galaxies, uh, the idea being that I can transfer that over to exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, and I've also done actually some, some transit det detection work. Uh, in my second year at university. So I've tried to sort of build some foundations. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to get an internship, uh, which finishes uh, at the end of this week, actually, um, working with Professor Amory Trio, uh, who's going to be one of our speakers in the next couple of weeks, uh, working with him on a detection tool that uh, potentially might even be able to be used uh, at Birmingham and perhaps uh, wider across um any any location in the earth uh, on, on earth sorry um that will be able to to refine uh how well we know about the about the um precision of uh transits uh the idea is we're not uh, necessarily discovering anything brand new here but what we're doing is uh, enabling more powerful telescopes uh again things like the james webb telescope to go and observe these planets and be able to know exactly when they're transiting so we, uh, we basically maximize the amount of research, the amount of scientific research we can do uh, with the telescope time we have, with the smallest amount of telescope time we have available. Um, so that's what I've been working on so far. I'm hoping to go on and do a PhD once I finish my undergraduate degree. Uh, I'll have to see what is being offered at the moment. And with the current climate, that could be quite difficult. Um, but in general, that is where I'm hoping to go. So I think in about five years time, I would probably just about be finishing my PhD uh, and we'll, we'll go on and see what, what that brings. Um, but ideally, yes, I'd, I'd like to go on into research uh, after I do my PhD, uh, perhaps uh, look at lecturing. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see if I've got what it takes for that. Uh, but there, there are some possible lines that I've looked at. Excellent. Well, I'm happy to let you know that that was not the last question that you will be asked today. We have one question on the YouTube chat and there, um, yeah, so someone's asking, do you have any comments on core accretion versus disk instability? Ooh, um, I must admit, uh, I, I'm gonna disappoint the, the viewer here. Uh, not a great deal, no. Um, that's not something I've, I've uh, encountered uh, a huge amount in in my undergraduate studies or in actually the research here. 
uh, that's probably a slightly more in-depth question. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not actually able to answer that. Sorry. No worries. Perfect. Seeing that there are no more questions on the YouTube live chat, I guess it's probably a good time to bring this session to a close. And Luke, thank you very, very much for this very enlightening talk. And I'm sure our audience has enjoyed it. And as always, we welcome any and all feedback from all our viewers. And you can send us an email via our email address, which we will post on the live chat or in the description. Or you can just find us on our social media pages on Instagram and Facebook. And tune in next week again for the sixth talk in Quarantine Talks. And we have a very special speaker coming oh, up next you. week. And it's going to be on Monday, as usual, at 3 p.m. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and just a, a very quick final comment. Uh, whoever asked that question, it is a fantastic question. Uh, if you send it, uh, the, the question to the Astrosoft email account, I will do my best yeah, to yeah, get back yeah. to you and provide you with a, a decent answer. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you for that question. Thank you, Luke. Oh, here it is. Do you ask